but it's not not often. So no, Selena, they won't be alarm calling at the vehicle. It's highly unlikely. I mean, we drive past squirrels all the time and they don't really alarm call at us. Perhaps if I was walking around, they may then alarm call at me. But these animals are intelligent. They know what is a threat to them and what isn't. Oh, well done, Brian, and following that batelier. Lovely to see it fly across the sky. Look how far that was, <laughs> amazing. A young juvenile batelier. And some Egyptian geese flying behind us. You can probably hear them. I'm just listening carefully in this area, and, and you know, times like this, if you don't see tracks of animals, but if you hear alarm calls, I don't know, I often get this gut feel that, you know, you need to be patient and just sit around and wait and you might see something. Another bird of prey. That's an adult batelier that was flying lower down. It was probably a bit well, just through the trees. There's a lot going on, so I've just heard the black-bellied bustard, B-U-S-T-A-R-D. Um, it's a beautiful bird, ground bird. They do this wonderful call and display. I just want to see if it does call again. So I really am trying to listen very carefully. Let's move forward a little bit, everyone. And just see if I can't find that bird quickly, the black-bellied bustard. Really beautiful bird. Might be sitting on a termite mound somewhere. They usually do that if they find a nice little little mound that gives them a bit of a vantage point to look around and and then as they call the call is probably or probably travels a bit further. So let's just see. Heard it again. It's somewhere here. Alright, I'm gonna have to scan carefully everyone. Let's see, because it is a wonderful bird to see. And it has got a beautiful call. They do this um the call sounds something like a little pop at the end. <laughs> Can you see it? Did it, was it behind the tree? That must have rolled back. Brian, Brian said he saw it, everyone. Let's just have a good look. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Gee, Brian, well done. Well done. There we go. Do the display for us again, please. Wow, Brian, well spotted. really is so helpful having another set of eyes on the vehicle as you can see and that was very well spotted look how well that bird is camouflaged and you see how it's walking along the ground let's just see if it calls again no, don't go behind the tree <laughs> it looks like something is chasing it there okay have a look come on yeah mm. Or it would call again. Let's stick on it. Come on. And you see it, it extends its neck and drops its neck very quickly as it calls. Watch. There we go. Did you, see, did you see that, everyone? See that little pop at the end there? Whoop! It 
But look at that. Look at that spot. <laughs> look how far away it is. That's amazing, Brian. Thank you very much. Wasn't that incredible? James wanted to know if these bustards construct any nest. They are ground nesting birds, James, so they lay eggs that are very, very well camouflaged. They probably get to get a pile of leaves or anything just to try hide them, but, uh, but they don't nest in the trees or anything. They're ground nesting birds. And it's incredible to see how they camouflage their, their eggs to make sure that those chicks are safe or the eggs are safe and even when the chicks hatch they're very well camouflaged so they can hide in the dense uh, uh, scrub oh some kudu everybody here we go Sorry, it breaks. <laughs> oh, we've got some kudu right here next to us. Looks like a, a herd of mostly females with some young males. There we go. Just when you think things aren't happening for you, bump into something. They're beautiful females. Look at that. See those very prominent white stripes down the body on the females? But they do look a bit strange. It looks like the neck has just been joined on. It doesn't look like it's meant to be part of the body because it's a slightly grayish color compared to the rest of the body, which is more brown. And you can see those very large ears. And watch as they walk. Those ears constantly move around. And the reason for that is they rely so much on their hearing while they're moving through the thicker dense scrub and bush because they are browsers they feed off, off the leaves of the trees so so these could rely a lot on their sense of hearing and their sense of smell to pick up on any predators or any danger and these are you know like I said mostly youngsters and females I don't see any big males the big males get those beautiful spiral horns That was a nice surprise. Very, very nice surprise. And they have beautiful antelope, the kudu. Very, very beautiful. It's always wonderful seeing them. And the males are definitely one of my favorites. Anyway, we're going to continue on and see what else we can find. Let's head to James and see if he's got an update for you. Our update is doves. Birds of peace up there, David. Do you see them being peaceful? That's not them, David. That is a bare branch of a tree. If you go up from there, and again, and to the right, and up, no, 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 <laughs> no up, up, there, 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 right, right, there, zoom. There we are. That's them there. Phew. Yay, well done, everybody. Sigh of relief that David can still see. Those are... <laughs> Those are laughing doves, and they are laughing at David now, because he thought they were invisible doves, which, of course, we don't get here. Well, we wouldn't know if we got invisible doves here, would we, David? They could be all over the place, really, by the very nature of the fact that they're invisible. And so it's, I suppose, a, a little less appreciated than our good friend, the Shivambalani, or the, um, as we know it, the, the green-spotted or emerald-spotted wood dove, and also not quite as common as the ring-necked dove. But they're just as important, and they go, Hurr, 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 hurr. See how impressed they were with that, David? Yes, they were nodding their heads in deep appreciation. I'm now going to play the call on my 
phone because I'm actually not convinced that I'm telling you the truth. I think they only do that when they land. Let me just look quickly. Um, laughing dove, play. Ah. Yeah, now it's really impressed. It's not making that horror noise at all, is it? Here we go. Come on. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure I've heard one of these things going horror, horror, horror. How very embarrassing. I shouldn't have played it. No one would have been any the wiser, David. Now, I bet Kirsten's told Byron that I made that mistake and he'll just never shut up when we get home. OK, let's move on from the invisible doves and press on. Humble laughing dove, which is uh, what I meant to say, of course, is that they don't go... Byron apparently is now extremely happy that I too have uh, been caught out. Um, look, I'm not going to put that in the same level of mistake as, as an ossicle. There are very few words that uh, could come close to ossicle. Especially that he then just had to go and check it out because he didn't believe. There is a... you see that very big bird? Well done, David. You found that one. That is a white-backed vulture skulking. But I think more importantly, it's... look... oh, it is a beastly-looking thing, isn't it? It looks very, very, uh, depressed. I thought I saw... I did. There's an oxpecker nest. And David, the chances of you seeing this at this stage of the day with the camera are negligible to zero, but we're going to give it a go. Can you see there? Yeah. Just go a little bit there. That's it. perfect. In the middle of the screen, you see no, no, hanging down a bit, down a bit. There. There's an oxpecker in there. You just saw the movement there. There it is. Look, they've got, that's where their little nest is. Hooray. Now, we're not going to dally with the oxpeckers because Byron, my good old pal, has managed to find our first big game of the afternoon. I have indeed, James, a beautiful herd of elephant, but they're moving very quickly past us. I'm not sure where they're heading. Heading to, oh, and they unfortunately crossing the boundary already, just behind us. That female's just having a good look at us. You see that she, wow, she's a beautiful big female. That's very possibly the matriarch. And they're disappearing off through the thicket there. A very quick view, but we got to, <laughs> got to find our, our elephant, which is great. Um, you know, unfortunately, straight across our boundary, it's one of those things. They do move um, very quickly if they want to. I wouldn't be surprised if they're heading into an area where there's possibly a dam. That's onto Buffalo's Hook. Um, so I, I think there's there's a dam that they're going to drink at, potentially. And, oh, can you hear a red-chested cuckoo? Can you hear that, everyone? There we go. Lovely sound. Can't see it, and that's quite far actually. Nice to see those elephant. Wasn't that a nice surprise? But uh, they seem to have um, something on the mind that, or they they definitely had in, an intention to head head somewhere, possibly to some water. At least we got to see them quickly, which was lovely. Nice little herd. There were some some youngsters. Uh, Probably around five or six years old. They weren't. They weren't much younger than that. So always nice to see elephant. Uh, 
Um, Aaron wanted to know if elephant poaching was a problem in the Kruger. Aaron, no, fortunately not. Not elephant. Um, so I'm just having a quick look around this area to see if there are any more elephant around here, but I think the whole herd have passed through. I don't see any others following. So Aaron, no, there, there's no problem with, with poaching of elephant in Kruger. In other parts of Africa, there is a problem though. And, uh, and it's very, very sad. Uh, it's, um, I think, predominantly up in East Africa, they do have some issues with the poaching of elephant in the ivory trade. Uh, which is terrible, but fortunately these areas the elephants are well protected and even in Botswana and that they quite safe See, I think it's been very, it's been a very interesting afternoon. It's, um, it's a little bit, a little bit cooler, cloudy, and it, it seems as if a lot of animals have gone into hiding almost. Predators, which I would have thought would be more active, have disappeared. Not too sure what happened to the Unkahuma pride. I know Herbert was trying to give us a hand in finding them because I actually went back to where that buffalo carcass was from this morning, and there was no sign of the lions. They've disappeared completely which is strange. So I'm not sure if they were chased off by perhaps a herd of elephant or, or what the reason is for them moving. But it can happen like that at times where animals just disappear. And I always say it's, it's good because uh, you can't always expect to see everything all the time. These are wild animals and they'll move wherever they want. And we do have to work a little bit harder at times, but I do think that the bush kind of kind of repays you if you have got patience and you do just enjoy being out here and taking it easy and driving around. You never know, things things do happen very quickly in front of you. starting to lose a bit of light now and I think it will probably get darker a lot earlier because of this cloud cover it's still very very cloudy so it most likely will get a lot darker earlier so the spotlights will come out and we'll see what we can find with them a friend of mine who used to work in this area before uh, Chris, he told me, he always said, well, oh, listen, while you're up there, if you ever want to find a leopard, you need to drive through Sandy Patch. He says that uh, always, he always had luck finding leopard around here. Yeah? And this is about my 30th time of driving through Sandy Patch, and I'm yet to find a leopard. So, Chris, if you are watching, um, you need to give me some more tips because <laughs> I can't seem to find one in this area. going to carry on looking around here hopefully we find something soon let's head back to James and see if he's found anything or if he's getting the bird calls right hello everybody again we've come up back towards where we thought the lions were earlier today Herbert's still knocking about here but it's starting to get a little bit dark and that means it's going to be difficult. There is a vulture up there and I'm just wondering if he isn't standing perhaps above the lions. Uh, or flying away. That is the white-backed vulture of course. So we'll just do a little turn up here. But I don't know where these things have gone and if Herbert can't find the tracks, I mean they must have flown away. going to keep a quick eye out here. Yeah. I think with the fading light we may have to call it quits on the lines. Let's just drive down this road. 
David says there's a termite mound that's being built just down here, and I think you did look at it, but we've got a special um, special wire we can use to get off the car. Now, Gracie, aged nine, you've asked a very good question, which I shall answer while we look at that bird that's sitting in the tree over there. Can you see it, David? Yes, well done. Um, that is a juvenile batelier, everybody. Gracie, your question is if... Ooh. Your question is if we were to play a bird call of a bird that is not from this area, would the birds here be afraid? Um, Gracie, no, I don't think they'd be afraid at all. I think what you'd find is that they just wouldn't recognize it. It's the same way that if I play, say, the call of a bird that's only found in Cape Town uh, to some of the doves or that batelier that's flying over there, they just wouldn't recognize it and so they wouldn't be afraid. They would be afraid if you played them, say, the call of an eagle or a, a bird of prey that might want to eat them. Then that would make them afraid, absolutely, and they would look out and maybe even alarm call. Good question. It's got very dark all of a sudden, and it's not because the sun has set. It's because the clouds are thickening overhead. We had almost no rain last night. There was just a sort of slightly irritating drizzle. I might actually have to turn the lights on. Mm. Now, Kathleen, you say that the lions were seen at the Juma Dam Cam uh, during the middle of the day and they headed south, which is where we started, you know. We started in the drainage line just to the south of the, of the pan, and we have found nothing, I'm afraid. Let's put some lights on. There we go. Well, one light. It seems the Juga has one light, David. You see that? One light facing to the right. Well, somebody sees us coming, they'll think we're a motorbike. That would be an extreme sport, everybody. Motorbiking through here. People often say, when I talk about horseback safaris, they say, oh, that's so dangerous. But that wouldn't stop them getting on a bicycle in this area. i got to tell you, I think bicycling around an area like this is uh, mildly insane. Elephants dislike bicycles immensely, and they will chase them. And lions are fascinated by bicycles, and they too will chase them. And you have to have the presence of mind, if you're on a bicycle in an area like this, you have to have the presence of mind to get off the bike if you see lions and stand. Which, of course, your immediate reaction if you're on a bicycle is to ride as fast as you can away. But unless you're able to ride at roughly 45 miles an hour, uh, through some soft sand, you're going to struggle to escape. David, where is your termite mound? Uh, halfway up. Halfway up Philemon's dip. David, are you eating? No. You're eating at work, aren't you? What are you eating, David? No, sir, would you like a piece? I'd love a piece. Thank you, David. No. You see? I'm only having one, everybody, out of principle because David wasn't going to share with me. <laughs> He thought I wouldn't ask for one while we were live. Hello, Paul. Excuse me while I finish my piece of nachi. And nachi, everybody, I think is a clementine in English. This is a good clementine, David. It's very sweet. But of course, it's not very good for us, but anyway. Um, Paul, you're wondering if we do any other work on the reserve when we go back from drive. No, we don't do any reserve work. We do do other work. Um, we do a bit of video editing. Um, the directors have got lots of bits and pieces that they have to do. Um, I sometimes write the odd script for our... Um, our roll-ins for TV, we do our clips, our clips for TV, and that's about it. There's no conservation work that we do here, though. That's all done by people on site, by the Juma staff. 
David, where is this thing? I don't believe you. It was that one. And it's no longer this one. No. There certainly isn't. That thing looks like it's been dormant for about eight years. Are you sure? You don't think that that was it, do you? No, I don't either. Sorry about that, everybody. No lions and no termites. Gosh. Hello, Winter Prism. Well, we looked at that completely inactive termite mound that has not been built in the last seven decades. Um, you want to know how long it takes them to make a mound that size? Winter Prism, a mound that size that we were looking at there would probably have taken, I'd say, maybe about five years. They say like a sort of big ball every year is what they're able to build. I've seen them building much faster than that though, so I'm not convinced that that's true. That one I would have put at about five years. And remember, it's a proverbial tip of the iceberg story where uh, much more of the termite mound is actually below the ground and it spreads down to the water table in many cases. So David, my pancreas is now in rebellion after that extremely sugar-shocked clementine you gave me. must apologize for eating everybody, but you know, one must teach these cameramen that they cannot sit there and scoff their faces off while we're live in the hopes that we won't try and share their meals. Despicable behavior. Thank you, Fran, for taking a great screenshot of me eating my clementine. We're going to go straight back towards the Juma Pan now and see if we can't find some sign of those lines. It's got cool now, they might get up and move. I think a little drive along to where those buffalo and zebra were earlier is probably also a good idea. Anyway, while we do that, let us update ourselves with uh, Byron's latest a piece of um, astounding vocabulary. <laughs> James, I unfortunately have got no updates for anybody. Um, we've been driving around, but no luck. Looks like James and I are struggling a little bit this afternoon. As I said, it's good. It keeps us humble. It makes us re remember that this is a wild area and we cannot guarantee anything. Sounds like some guinea fowl calling in the distance. The, the, the bird that sounds like a bicycle pump almost, a squeaky bicycle pump. <laughs> Something like that. B was saying that if she had to listen to all the bird calls that, that I do, every bird in, in Southern Africa ends with a giggle, and um, I do apologize, Jen B. It's, uh, I, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I think because I, 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 after the call, I realize how ridiculous I sound. So, um, uh, I think that's, that's why I just end up giggling. <laughs> getting a spotlight but it, it's still a little bit too light for the spotlight I think uh, yeah it's still a little bit too light it's now that 
I always call it an awkward light because it's not quite dark enough for a spotlight and it's not really light enough to see very clearly. So we're just taking a slow drive and scanning the area. You never know, we could still spot something. Some cicada bugs. Now, can you hear that everyone? Can you hear these cicada bugs? Now I can explain to you about these cicada bugs because they are very very interesting. Now these cicada bugs and I would normally ask my guests how do you think they they make that sound and you can all send us your, your answers if you'd like to if you'd like to hazard a guess as how, how these cicada bugs make the, the, that call that sound they sound like crickets but uh, in fact they don't stridulate which is that rubbing of the legs together uh, which causes that sound the crickets make and what the cicada bug actually does and I find this incredible they've got with the, with the cicada bug the abdomen is about this well call it quite round and within the abdomen there is there's a thin membrane that runs straight through it and basically there are two tendons attached to this membrane inside the body and they contract them, their muscles inside the body and release them and what it does is it causes that membrane to bend so it'll bend up and then release and what that does is it creates a clicking sound the best way I can describe it is if you think of a, a coke can perhaps um, or, or any any can of a uh, cool drink and when you press it in you, you hear that clicking sound it clicks and it pops back out so that's what happens with this membrane and then they have these these cavities which basically resonate that sound and cause that sound to to um, basically to well resonate and sound a lot louder than it is and it's known that the, the the process is known as timbles and those those timbles um, cause that sound to to be a lot louder and what they do is they contract those muscles and cause that membrane to release very quickly and that clicking sound is happening so quickly it causes that noise that we can hear at the moment and it really is fascinating how that whole motion can cause this incredibly loud sound and in the middle of summer you can drive under trees and where there are a lot of cicada bugs it's deafening it really is incredibly loud I remember a story I think years ago there was a cicada bug in the in the Sydney Opera House there was one bug in the Sydney Opera House and because of the acoustics around they had to close the Opera House for I, I can't remember what the, the extent was I think it was a few weeks because this bug was making so much noise in the opera house it obviously disturbed any um, any opera or any event that went on in there and they had to try and I think they fumigated or had, they had to try and find this bug somehow um, so and isn't that incredible I read read that um, but it, it was a few years ago it was a few years ago so one cicada bug closed down the Sydney Opera House James said he taught me a great zebra call, and he asked if I can, if I can, uh, can make that call or the sound a zebra makes. <laughs> um, zebra, Paul, uh, yeah, you really put me on the spot here, didn't you? So the zebra does a sound like. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, no, no, that's not it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, zebra, oh dear, Paul, you've got me stumped at the moment. You put me on the spot, and I don't think I can do it. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll try work on it. No, no, I actually, I can't. You're gonna have to ask James because James taught me so well. You can ask him, and he'll do it for you. <laughs> oh dear. I 
I have a feeling the ladies in the FC are bent over their chairs at the moment with laughter and uh, that's why they're not talking to me at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what's happened, everyone. So the girls are laughing at my expense. So oh dear. Come on, where are all these little scorpions? So, Kristen from North Carolina would like to know what are some of the rules that we give to our guests when they come on a safari? So that I do know, Kristen. Um, and usually what I do with the guests is when we arrive at the lodge, um, give them a brief bit of orientation around the, uh, of the area and what we're going to be doing on our safari. And then once we get onto the vehicle, quick game drive briefing basically starts off by me telling them, what have we got there, Impala. Uh, so, what we do is I'll say to them, please keep the arms and legs in the vehicle at all times during the game drive, and also try and avoid touching any branches. While we're driving, you will come across branches that overhang into the road. So please be careful, mind your heads, but don't touch them because a lot of the branches have got sharp thorns on them and we don't want you to cut your hands or anything. Um, please remain seated at all times during the game drive. And the reason for that is the animals pick up on the movement on the vehicle and they will see us if we do move around too much. And also while I'm driving, it can get a bit bumpy and we don't want to lose a guest. I haven't lost anyone yet, so I don't want to lose anyone um, in the future. Uh, the other thing is, Please just ask as many questions as you'd like while we're driving around. Um, if we do get into any, any big cat sightings or any predator sightings or get close to animals, just keep your voices down because the animals obviously react to loud noises and we don't want to startle them. And then uh, if you need the bathroom at any stage, let me know and I'll gladly stop and find you a, uh, a safe bush to go behind. And occasionally we like to say, you know, every tree is a lavatory out here. <laughs> So we do try and find your safe spot. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What is it? Can you see through there? Is that a little daker hiding in there? What is that? It's a little, no, it is a little daker. Oh, shame. It's a little daker just lying down. Just caught a glimpse of an eye. I don't want to shine on the spotlight on him too long. But he's lying down. I just saw these little two eyes. I thought it might be something small, um, uh, almost like a genet or something. But it's a little daker that's lying in the in the scrub. And uh, and Kristen, that's uh, that's about it. And then you know, I always remind my guests we out here to have fun and enjoy it. So let's do that. And. We'll hopefully find as many of the animals as we possibly can that they'd like to see. Legs in the vehicle, don't stand, and um, and those are usually the, the most important rules. And don't get off the vehicle unless I say it's okay. I'm going to continue my search for little creatures. Speaking of little creatures, let's head back to James. <laughs> Excuse me, everybody. I'm just lolling and ruffling at Byron's hilarious joke. I'll tell you what his next two will be. His next two will be uh, something about my lack of hair. And then it will be something about how old I am. Those are vultures, and that's why I stopped here. Because vultures often signify that there are some sort of predator around. Indeed, if you were to ask Graham Wallington, he would tell you, if you saw a vulture, you knew there was a lion there. That was our joke in the Mara. Um, <laughs> it's not true. Um... 
but I'm just wondering why they've landed here. Now we've come onto this road, I drove to exactly where they were yesterday, saw no sign, but what we did see was a giant knobthorn tree that had been pushed over, and I wonder if a lion, an, an elephant didn't come into that area to drink from that pan and chase the lions off sometime during the course of the day. That's what I think's happened. Now, we've come back onto the road where those buffalo and zebra were earlier on, where I suggested they watch out. And let's see if the lions haven't popped out somewhere around here. Herbert has done a very valiant job of trying to find them this afternoon, but I'm afraid the light has now got the better of him. We, of course, can carry on because we're in the car. I have a superb spotlighting technique, as you can see, David. Yes. I find it is always a good idea to conduct. Pretend you're conducting the slow movement of a Mozart piano concerto. You see, David, you paint the bush. Yes, that is the most effective way. Yes. Now, there's some impala up ahead. They don't look terrified at all. There is, however, the smell, slight smell of offal in the air. Now, I don't know if you know what I mean, everybody, but the insides of an animal that's just been killed, very macabre, I'm sorry, uh, it smells very distinctive. And I just got a whiff of that. The wind is coming from over there. Our noses, of course, as human beings, grossly underutilized. I find my nose to be very sensitive. I wanted to make a joke about Byron there, but I decided not to after I mentioned my sensitive nose. It wouldn't be fair. Byron has very good, very good hygiene. There's definitely a smell of death in the air. I don't know why I should think turning the car... Oh, sorry, David. I dropped the clutch there without letting, pushing the car out of gear. I gave myself a bit of a shock. Whew, are you right? I wanted to just roll down the road here and see if... Can you smell that? Yeah. But that's rotting flesh. That's not new. Those buffalo that were around here have disappeared. Deb, good question. You say are all three kills completely gone? Certainly the baby buffalo from yesterday was. Uh, the buffalo from that earlier yesterday, I don't know. I never saw where it was. But it's certainly been abandoned. If it, in fact, it has. I, I don't think it's finished completely. Herbert went there earlier. That's where he started his search today, and I don't think it is completely finished. No. We'll just make our way slowly down here. See what else we can see. Of course, we're now into the time of chameleons. Have you seen a chameleon yet this year, David? Haven't. Not this year, the season. I mean. No. Good, okay. So that would be a first for both of us. We haven't seen any. Goodness, imagine. Imagine we were to see the first one, David. We would be hailed as heroes when we got back to camp. People would fling money at us and give us, offer us favors. Such would our, so at least, <laughs> so would our stock go up in the camp. At the moment, however, I don't see any chameleons, David. All I hear is one lonely virtual starling making his final call before he goes into his comfortable little tree hole cavity nest. But I've no doubt his family is cooking him a very fine meal of roasted termites. Not from the mound that you took me to which of course has been dormant for more than a century.
Right, P.T. Carmani. I'm not sure I've heard from you before, and so it's really good to hear from you. Thank you for talking to us. I'm just talking, t turning the game drive radio down. P.T., you say, have we ever used drones uh, to for the drives? We have. We have used them, and the best example of us using drones, or a drone, was on a wild dog hunt. It was the most phenomenal experience. Um, of course, you can see around here the bush is very thick. And to try and follow wild dogs through an area like this at the speed at which they go is A, insensitive because we make a huge noise and that makes it difficult for them to hunt and hear each other because their ears are hugely important. And secondly, well, we just break the cars trying to get through this stuff. And we had a wonderful experience where we put a drone up above the dogs hunting and so from the final control they would say they could see me and the dogs and they would say okay go left go right and I could stay well back from the hunt and just move in at the last kind of moment. There's some impala up ahead. I'm going to turn the lights off. Let's see if they are not perhaps looking or alarming. So PT Yes, we have used them. The long and the short of it is, though, you're not actually allowed to use them around here unless you have a very special license to do it, especially because it's in a wildlife area. Um, we're absolutely uh, in the process of sorting it out. And in fact, Connor, our engineer slash drone pilot, are you right there, David? Why are you throwing the camera on? Um, he is just, we've just got another drone, and it's a very nice one. We're going to put a very special camera on it. So completely part of our plans because it really does give a very nice overhead view of what's going on especially for something like a wild dog hunt it's by far the most sensitive way to follow a wild dog hunt come on Trigger, there we go right, I'm going to be at the front of the queue when these vehicles are finally put out to pasture right, I don't hear any startled animals around here Hello, Aaron, not from New Zealand. We have an Aaron in New Zealand, who's a regular commentator. Uh, you are apparently a new Aaron, which is very good. Uh, I don't know if you're newer or older than the other one, but for us, you're new. And you say, do the, are the vehicles especially equipped so that when we go over the ripples or corrugations in the, in the road, it makes the, the picture look smooth? No, the vehicles are not specially equipped with, uh, with any, well, they are, but not for that. And that is brought about by a very specialized stabilizer on the camera and that's why it looks fairly smooth when we drive and I mean this is a fairly recent advent while we talk about technology Aaron uh, when I got here just about a year and a half ago we used cameras that didn't have nearly as sophisticated um, stabilization which meant that if we were driving along uh, we couldn't you couldn't turn the camera to the side at all because they you know it moved around a huge amount these cameras you can turn to the side and pretty much whatever the car does you hardly notice it so it's purely in the camera it's got nothing to do with a vehicle's special suspension these vehicles are now 20 years old just about they're not young and they certainly don't drive like they're young I imagine a Model T Ford might be rather similar driving experience. This one also needs its shocks ribs redone. Now these lions have uh, disappeared, so we're just going to continue and see what else we can see. We will try and find a chameleon. And while I try and find a chameleon, let's go to Byron and find out what his spotlighting technique is like. Does he paint uh, paint the bush gently, or does he, as with most of his life, sort of approach it bull in a china shop? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a very gentle spotlighter, James. Uh, scan carefully and thoroughly. <laughs> we haven't found anything yet, everyone, but uh, it's too soon to panic, as I say. I always say. I'm sure we are going to find something interesting soon to show you. Yeah, I thought I saw a snake in the tree there. It was just a branch that was a little, a little bit bent. 
it's quite an art to try and drive and spotlight at the same time. It's very tricky. Um, I do find it difficult at times and one of the reasons is I've been very spoilt in the past and those of you who have watched before I've spoken about my friend Judas on a regular basis and Judas uh, Judas was a tracker that I used to work with and we, we spent five years together working together and you can imagine the relationship that we had we were very very good friends and Judas has been tracking for 30 years so you can imagine his knowledge on the bush and not learnt from a book purely witnessing so much animal behavior and uh, and he would sit next to me in the evenings he would jump into the vehicle and he would sit with the spotlight and he just shine but he would pick up on so much at night he'd find snakes and he'd find scorpions and he'd find uh, chameleons and little genets and civets it was wonderful to work with him because he would wouldn't miss much He just knew, he had a sixth sense almost on where to look. Rishi, it's not dangerous to drive in the dark. Uh, we do many nighttime safaris and we call them night drives and, the, and we do it for a short period of time while we uh, just maybe an hour after sunset and the reason for that is we're looking for some nocturnal wildlife, anything that might be active around this time of night but um, it's not dangerous. Uh, you know we are very careful. There's a giraffe off to my left. I don't want to shine the light on it. Can you see there? Beautiful big giraffe. So Rishi, it's not dangerous and, and uh, we, I mean we are still very careful but it's not dangerous at all. As long as you kind of know where you're going, it's okay. So you don't get lost. But I do think it helps um, to be experienced when you are driving around the bush. Not just at night but during the day especially. And if you are new to it, I wouldn't suggest it because occasionally animals might pop out and if you get a fright or don't know how to react, then you could find yourself in a bit of hot water. But the guides and uh, that work in these game reserves are all quite well qualified and they generally know what to do. In situations if maybe a, you jump you bump into an elephant or something along the road at night just how to avoid any any situation Sorry, Brian, I'm going to take this road and there's that little road that goes through the drainage line. And I think maybe we'll have some luck down there with something interesting. Let's see. We spoke about it before. I think a lot of the reptiles and that aren't quite active just yet because it's still very dry. We do need a bit more rain. So that's possibly why they aren't out, as, out and about just yet. And also, the other thing is there are not many insects, and a lot of these uh, animals, like the chameleon, for one, and scorpions, they all feed on insects. We have seen some scorpions around the DRC, actually, which is where we stay. So often we find ourselves sitting with our feet on the chairs, rather than just leaving them on the floor, because every now and then there's a scorpion which walks past. We do have to look out for them. Okay. Um, Margaret, uh, Margaret asked if I'm ever afraid of an animal coming after me and Margaret, I think it would be unfair to say that, um, that I'm not scared, I wouldn't say scared, that I'm not cautious. I am very cautious all the time because I think if you become blasé you can find yourself in some serious trouble. So I'm cautious but I wouldn't say I'm scared uh, and I think uh, 
the thing is, as long as you've got a respect and understanding for the animals, you generally, you should generally be okay. Right, I thought I saw something there, but I may be mistaken. I th no, I think it's my imagination. It is indeed my imagination. So Margaret, no, I wouldn't say I'm scared, but I am careful and respectful of animals. And um, I think it, you know, I think it, so there's a big race to see who can find the first chameleon of the season. Nothing on my side just yet. Let's head back to James, old boy, and see what, uh, what he has. That's two of them, everybody. Two of those jokes I told you about. The old joke and the small joke. <laughs> Soon we will have the bald joke. Now, we am afraid have failed to find the chameleon so far. We're going to Buffalo Dam to see if there isn't something that has pitched up there. At the moment, not a great deal going on. Many impala with their eyes shining. Uh, Byron says that uh, calling me old boy wasn't a joke, it was a term of endearment. Piffle to that, I say. It's quite a good word that, don't you think, David? Piffle. Uh, piffle, it means uh, nonsense. Piffle. A uh, curious one, you would like 30 seconds of the Jamie Patterson spotlight technique. At this stage of the game, I'll try anything. There we are. Jamie Patterson is the most powerful shoulders in the Sabi sand. She is able to hold her spotlight like this for the whole drive. How that is, given that she has the narrowest shoulders in the Sabi sand, I'm not sure, but surely she does manage it because I'm not sure that I could do this for much more than 30 seconds. I'm already getting a deep burn in my shoulder, David. Oh, I wanted to swap hands. There we are. Does she swap hands? She just holds the one up. Must come from her days as a ballerina. There we go. I think that must be almost 30 seconds. It hasn't been any more effective than my technique. There must be something here, come on. Janet. Art Fark. Everybody, while we're driving through here, finding not much at all, I would like you to say the term Art Fark. On the count of three, everyone at home is going to say Art Fark. And um, you will feel the, uh, the immense sense of satisfaction it gives you. Are you ready? One, uh, two, three, Art Fark. Once more, one, two, three, Art Fark. You see, I told you it would make you feel amazing. Oh, an owl. I've got a huge fright, everybody. It's flown away, obviously. Do you see it? Oh. It was an enormous spotted eagle owl, everyone, that I'm afraid I didn't spot soon enough. Sorry, David, did I? Did I? I am afraid I threw everything all over the place, everyone. Don't worry, David will fix it. Serves him right for trying to eat without me. Okay, we'll go back towards Bivelzog Dam. We're not far from there now. Let's see if anything's turned up there. Those lions, Herbert didn't find even one track this afternoon. It is completely bizarre. The other reason for being in this area is we might be lucky enough to find one of the other leopards that we see. There is a zebra running away. We won't shine on them. If you are a new viewer and wondering why we're not shining on the impala and the zebra and that sort of thing, Brian may, Byron may well have explained it. But it's because we don't want to... It's because we don't want to blind them and they are diurnal. So we will shine on nocturnal animals, not diurnal ones. 
Dodi, you're in Canada and you say, are Karula's cubs still alive? Dodi, they're absolutely alive. Tomorrow is their ninth, birth, ninth month birthday. They're doing very well indeed. We spent three hours with them yesterday. We had a wonderful time with them. Unfortunately, their kill was stolen by hyenas in the night. So they went back south. Karula killed something else in Little Gauri this morning and she took the cubs back to feed on them. They're absolutely fine, Dodi. They're doing very, very well indeed. But that is to be expected with a mother like the great queen. Now, oh, come on. There must be something at the water hole. Hello, Marianne in Arkansas. You want to know if we know the whereabouts of Sindelai, the male leopard? And I'm afraid the answer is negative. We do not know. His collar was taken off, which is excellent. So he's on his own. And yeah, it's wonderful. He's gone off and he's doing fine. He's made four or five very large kills uh, that we know of, probably a lot more, uh, while he still had his collar on. And so he's off on his own, making his merry way in the world. I've no doubt he will come back every so often back here. But a bit like quarantine and Gunyuma, once they reached round about his age, they started to wander further and further away from home. Kunyuma's never seen here anymore. He's down on the river uh, between Londolosi and Malamala. Uh, quarantine, of course, has set up, sort of, or trying to set himself up, actually, in his brother's territory, around Cheetah Plains. Now, I did see a bush baby. I saw its eyes, David. It was jumping. Unfortunately, it has jumped away. Anyway, so it goes with the general luck of the afternoon. Never mind. Shadow is the leopard that I'm worried about, everyone. I, I think she's... Um, know where she is. I haven't heard or seen hide nor hair of her. We know that the Ingrid Dam female was pushing from the south into her territory. We know that Karula is spending a huge amount of time in what was Shadow's territory. And so I don't know what that poor leopard, tragic leopard, she is. I don't know what's happening with her. Right, we've arrived at Biffleshook Dam, everybody. Great excitement. Edge of your seat stuff. Everybody's biting their nails to see what we might see here. David, just take a deep breath and don't get a fright when the great plethora of wildlife assails our eyes. Are you ready? Oh. Two Egyptian geese. Fascinating. Uh, that's all. Two magical Egyptian geese standing on the water. That's part of an impressive trick, really. Didn't know they could do that, did you, David? Look at them standing on the water. They're feeding on algae. And I must just tell you, before we leave them, uh, well, there are two reasons they're in the water. One, of course, they're feeding. The other is probably because it's quite a good place to hide if you're not perching. They do perch, um, or they don't perch, but they do live in trees quite often. But uh, I think it's quite a good place to stay away from potential predators, like a leopard, which um, isn't here. But also that Egyptian geese, you will read in every single ornithological text, eat algae and basically they're herbivorous. Well, the Egyptian geese here, those two in particular, they love fish. And it's red. You will read that they don't eat any kind of fish. But in fact, these ones do. We've seen them do it, and that is very interesting, but not as interesting as the fact that Byron has managed to find a small primate, not me. And everyone, I've managed to find a bush baby, but it's jumping around very, very quickly. I'm trying to see if I can get it for you and we can show you. Just hang on. It's quite tricky to see these little creatures, especially at night with the camera. Um, let me just have a look. There were one or two jumping around. Oh, Brian, I still see an eye reflection every now and then there. Um, so. Uh, 
Hang on, hang on. Let me just see. There we go. Yeah. There. There, you can see the eye. There we go. Around there. All right. Let's see. I think I wonder if James has found one. I can still see that one, but James may have found one. We have got one there. Can you see it, Davy? No, it's gone behind there. Oh, it's gone. Sorry everyone, I did see it. David even saw it. And now it's gone. Let's keep trying, David. Let us, let us not lose hope. I do feel a little spit of rain on my chin. Oh dear. <laughs> Let's just keep going along the road here. It was a nice shot of the stars you took there, David. Well done. It was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any stars, of course. There's just a cloud. Right, Byron, I think, has got a bush baby or an update. One of the two. No bush baby. It moved off, but I think we're in a good area to find them. So let's see. Um, they are so fast and so agile when they're jumping through the trees. It's incredible. All right. See what we can find around here. Silver cluster leaf grove almost. You can see just all these trees around us are silver cluster leaves. There's some impala off to my right, so I don't want to shine the light on them. So I'm checking these trees very carefully for any bush baby activity. Or perhaps something else in the trees, you never know. wonder if it's going to rain. And Brian says he felt a drop earlier. Oh, I can see, yeah, I, I have now also felt a drop, Brian. see so the mud so it's predicted to rain at seven o'clock and as we know the weathermen are always very very on time and always completely accurate <laughs> surprised I haven't seen many owls last time I was here so in June um, I managed to find about three or four different uh, uh, different giant eagle owls and I have not heard a single one since I have been back uh, this this trip. I wonder if it hasn't got to do with, with the, the drought perhaps. With it being a bit drier maybe, maybe they've moved into areas where there's a bit more water, a bit more activity for food. light little drizzle but obviously don't want the camera to get wet. Do you need a hand there Brian? Are you okay? Okay we're just going to try put on our cover quickly everyone. There's our camera cover. I'll just, um, I think I'll put that one here. Is it this little one that you want? That won't be okay for now. Okay, so we're just quickly putting on our cover, everyone. Um, just mainly for the camera, that's the most important part. Goodbye. <laughs> Don't worry, this will be very, very quick. Hi. <laughs> Something flew into into my face earlier, and there's a little beetle. I don't know where it's gone now. I don't know where it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, that's it. We won't be too long, everyone. Just a quick adjustment. There we go, that should be all right. Is that okay, bro? Yeah. Okay. Luckily, we don't have too much more time out here, so hopefully it doesn't start raining too hard. And we, we were caught in the rain this morning. It drizzled, uh, not too hard, but it, enough to enough to make us wet. And uh, and then it stopped. Then it cleared up, but it's been uh, it's been cloudy all day, so it's been threatening. But just no no serious rain. So hopefully we get some proper rain this evening after game drive, not now. I'm looking very, very carefully to see if I can't find any little sign of a creature this evening. But alas, I have nothing just yet. Let's head back to James and see if he has an update. We found a wolf spider, everybody, and then we got off the car and tried to set up a shot where we could show it to you, and it ran away. Anyway, we will now attempt to find a chameleon. But regardless of what we find, I am overjoyed with the sense of cool that my skin feels. There's the odd spittle of rain coming out of the sky. The temperature is perfect. And I'm looking forward to a night where I will be actually be able to sleep in a relative dryness. Wouldn't that be nice, David? Yes. Not just yet, of course. We have a few more minutes left of drive. There's something crawling on my leg. I don't know what it is worry about that later. Hopefully it's not a deathly scorpion. Hello tube jar. This is a very uh, unusual name, tube jar. Now there is uh, another spider. Tube jar, I will answer your question. That is a really good spider. Davy, can you see that? In the middle of the spotlight. There, look at that. How cool is that? It's not a wolf spider. That's one of the baboon spiders. I think, I think it's out hunting. It'll have a burrow somewhere nearby. You can see it's enormous pedipulps. Those are those things in the front. And it's eyes, that's what I saw. I saw its eyes shining. And on the ends of those pedipalps will be the fangs, which it will use to envenomate the hapless thing it catches tonight. It'll be beetles and that sort of thing that the spider is after. How wonderful is that? That's much more impressive than the first one I saw. So for any of you who are or sort of afraid of tarantulas and that sort of thing. This is the African equivalent of a tarantula. But they are pretty harmless to people. They're one or two species. I think probably the nocturnal ones like this that can give you a little bit of a nip. Now, Dave, just flick the camera. If you pa tilt it up slightly, you may see a little bit more. A little bit more. There. Back in. There's a grasshopper there moving. Yeah. Now, that grasshopper, were it to be bitten by the spider, it would probably die a fairly slow death, but it would be wrapped in silk. So although that spider is a hunting spider, in so much as it doesn't, um, it doesn't lay, it doesn't make a web. Oh, that one's gone. Let's go back to the spider. Um, what it will sit, it absolutely has um, silk. There we go. Look, look, look. 
How cool is that? It's absolutely got silk uh, spinnerets that it will use to wrap up whatever it's bitten. It's, you know what? It's actually it spotted the... Ooh, it's on a headlong course for the grasshopper. The grasshopper is behind the little piece of bush there. Come on, spider. We're going to see a kill, everybody. After this evening of uh, searching for predators all the time, finally we found one, and it's on the hunt. Spider kill live. I think it's got real legs, Dave. Spider kill live. It is a, well, look, it's not very high action right now, but uh, this is a stalking spider. I'm sure it's picking up the motion of the grasshopper. Can you see both, Dave? Yeah, can Come on, do something now. I think a spider is probably infinitely patient. Right, the grasshopper is slowly breaking cover by mistake. Looks to be about to hop, unfortunately. Come on. Spider, you're not going to eat if you lie there like that. I think, oh, he's hopped away. Oh, the spider's seen him hop away. And I'm afraid not going to eat that particular grasshopper. Tough luck, Mr. Spider. We'll leave him there as we head for home. How cool was that? <laughs> Ooh, what isn't cool is that the car is not starting. <laughs> oh dear, David, that's a, that's a little distressing. Right, while I try and start the car, let's head to Byron. We're okay. Wonderful that James got to see that baboon spider. That is really interesting. They are beautiful, beautiful spiders. Let's see, we haven't had any luck just yet with anything else, other than a few raindrops. Perhaps. James and I will have to practice our night drives again, <laughs> trying to find little creatures for you. Saw those bush babies, but they were so quick, they just disappeared. Yeah. Sometimes I think your eyes play tricks on you. I think it's just a leaf, but I'm rather going to double check just to make sure. Yeah, it is indeed a leaf. Will you look at that? <laughs> Wonder what happened to that Unkuhuma pride. They seem to, dis to have disappeared today. And I think they've possibly gone into this drainage line, not not far from us, just to our right. And I think they've probably just had their full of buffalo. If, if you think they've fed almost two days on buffalo, so it's a lot of buffalo to get through. But uh, who knows? They may return to that to that other carcass at some point during the course of the evening or tomorrow. Lara, my favorite animal is a honey badger. Honey badger and elephant. I love them, absolutely love them. But I've not seen a honey badger in I think three or four years for some reason. They just keep eluding me, unfortunately. I would love to see honey badger again, but that's my favorite animal. I think purely because they're just so tenacious. They, they're incredible creatures. They're not afraid of anything. And, um, and they really are, I think they've just got such character. And that's why I love them so much. So honey badger and then elephant. I just really, really enjoy elephant. They're so peaceful and I do think, I do think that they understand
understand and pick up on our behavior and our feelings actually if I can say that, I do think so there is a a part of me which thinks they can pick up on on our attitude towards them I think they're incredibly intelligent animals there's a lot of impala around here at the moment and those uh, no and I think that's why I really enjoy the elephant and I love spending time with them interesting to see how all the impala all the impala have moved um, out into the clearings for this evening and especially with this wind it's easier for them to look out and listen for for predators in the open as opposed to in the thickets so all the impala have moved out into the clearings for safety anyway it doesn't look like we've had any further luck Everybody, thank you very much for this afternoon. I hope you've all enjoyed it, and uh, perhaps we have some rain later. Thank you to Brian and the thumb. <laughs> the thumb out. <laughs> there we go. And we shall see you tomorrow again. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And James is going to end off the show and say goodbye to you. Goodbye and good night. Well, not just yet, everybody. I'm going to be with you for the next three and a half minutes or so. There's a dragonfly. I'm not going to ask you to track that one, David. Yes. There's a little bit of precipitation coming out of the sky. And, of course, soon we will have the great... Oh, my goodness. Byron drove straight past it. <laughs> there it is, David. Chameleon. <laughs> Byron is on this road, everybody. He drove straight past it. Bad luck for him. I suspect what he was doing is turning around and talking to you. But he did not see the first chameleon of the season. Poor old bee dog. There it is. Flap-necked chameleon. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much. We shall name it James, says Kirsten. Well, I think that's a very fine idea. And notice how already it has turned duller olive green color because it knows it's been spotted. Good. All right, let us drive on to quarantine clearing, see what else Byron's driven past. What a stroke of luck. Hate to think how many I drove past today. Byron will be tearing his hair out now, of course, because Kirsten would have told him that I've spotted the chameleon. <laughs> Apparently he didn't react because his heart is too broken. Poor little fellow. Well, you know, David, he's still a young man. He has much time left. He's not old and wizened like me. drive onto the middle of the clearings and what you will see is probably as I just shine the light like that is just the flashing of eyes. Can you see the flashing of eyes? No, we wouldn't see it no, because we're not behind the light. Anyway, the flashing of eyes is just hundreds of impala come onto the clearings. It's going to be a blustery, difficult night for them. On account of the fact that it is very moonless, Just have a quick look over the edge here, and then we'll bid you a fond farewell for the evening. No spotlighting technique, bar the very lucky flash onto that chameleon, has proved successful today. Anyway, there it is. And I'm glad you're all celebrating the first chameleon, of course, an astounding achievement on our part, David, wouldn't you say? 
Yeah, it's definitely worth an extra helping of sausages or whatever it is we're having for lunch, supper this evening. I doubt it'll be sausages. David, why are you stomping on the floor? There are insecta attacking you. Poor David is being attacked by insecta. All right, everyone, that is going to be it from us to the end, to, tonight. Tonight, yes. Okay, a big thank you to David. Thank you, David, for your efforts. Yes. Thank you to Byron, of course, and Brian on the other vehicle. I said their names correctly. And to Kay Max Smith in the final control, along with Louise Pavid. Mostly, of course, to all of you, who, without which, this would be completely impossible. We'll see you in the morning at 5 o'clock. Bye-bye.